I think if the youth haven't already left, uh, they may want to do so. I was out visiting in the different rooms that are set up, and a lot of work went into getting ready for this Sunday, and uh, hopefully some of you went and saw that. It's pretty impressive. The kids' layout's pretty nice. Well, anyway, with the youth themselves, they have better snacks and coffee than we do, so I'm telling you. It took all my energy to come up here instead of just join them out there. I mean, they like little, little ho-ho, little ding-dong snacks and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, we ain't got no ho-hos or ding-dongs out here, I'm telling you what. Anyway, yeah, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's snacks, right? Right? Yeah, say, hey, we're going to continue our journey through the book of Acts. Today, we're going to be uh, going to Acts chapter 3, verse 11, Acts chapter 3, verse 11. And uh, just in case you've uh, already for, forgot or weren't here the last couple weeks, we are returning to the scene of a miracle. And unlike many miracles that are talked about, that are still happening today, by the way, but unlike many of the miracles that uh, we hear about today, this particular miracle happened before a huge crowd of people who knew that this man had been crippled for 40 plus years, and they were stunned by the fact is there's no way to fake this one. This man couldn't walk since birth, and all of a sudden there he is by the name of Jesus, dancing around and prancing and praising God. That's a pretty neat trick. In any event, the crowds were amazed. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick right back up where this miracle happened. They had moved from the gate called Beautiful into the outer courts and were suddenly apparently moving towards Solomon's colonnade. And it's kind of an area. And now crowds are running to them and they are astonished at what they see. This man who could not walk for his entire life, who had been begging for his very existence, was now on his feet by the name of Jesus. So we're going to spend some time in Acts chapter 3, verse 11, picking right back up where we've been. Let's prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word. Father, thank you for the opportunity to present and to be reminded of what you've done and what you are doing here today. Lord, I pray that you would move all of us to get a deeper understanding of your nature, your character, and the power in your name. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 11. Excuse me, Acts chapter 3, verse 11. I found last week as I was reading the text, I had been studying it all week long. And I couldn't make out some of the words as I was standing before you reading it. And I said, it said, is it there in the afternoon or three in the afternoon? I can't make out that word. And because I've been studying the text all week, I knew it was three in the afternoon and I just pressed on. And then I found another word that I couldn't make out. I said, what's going on here? I can't see. Some of y'all share my grief, I'm sure. Yes, yeah, yes. Yes, or the trombone, right? Acts chapter 3, verse 11, let's go to the Word of God. And Acts chapter 3, verse 11 says this. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, men of Israel... Why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one, and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you all can see, as you can all see. Whoa. Okay, so Peter, <clears throat> seeing the crowds gather together, takes full advantage of the crowds and begins to unpack for them why they're seeing this miracle. And so let's unpack this together. So the first thing they say is, why does this surprise you? Why does this bona fide miracle, this supernatural, amazing thing surprise you? Well, gee whiz, because it's a miracle and we've never seen such a thing before. But then I like the next question. Why do you stare at us? 
Why are you looking at me as if my own goodliness and godliness and greatness did this power? As if I am superhuman and I did something in me. Why are you staring at me? Well, you know how we tend to do that, we human beings. We have a tendency to fall into what is often known as the super-Christian syndrome. Raise your hand if you're aware of the super-Christian syndrome. Oh, this is a malaise that apparently many people are unaware of. Okay, well, let's unpack this some more. So he's asking, why do you stare at me? Why do you, why do you think that somehow my own power did this? Why do you think that my own godly, or somehow it came from me? It didn't come from me. It came from God. I mean, even the person who was healed was running around praising Peter, praising John. Oh, thank you, Peter. You healed me. Thank you, John. No, he did not. He praised God. He knew where it came from. So the super-Christian syndrome, basically what ends up happening is we look at people who maybe are further along in their journey of faith or maybe they exhibit a maturity in Christ or, or God has used them in some significant way or we see their spiritual gifts on display and we go, my, what an amazing Christian. I know some of you have a tendency to put me in that category and place me on a pedestal. <sighs> You know, but so it's the super Christian syndrome is this thought that, okay, I get it. The pastor can do powerful things. Oh, okay, I get it. This missionary can do powerful things. But what about a housewife? What about an employee in a corporate workplace? What about an IRS auditor? Ooh. So we have a tendency to think that somehow these people who have gifts that are obvious. Can I just point out to you for a second that the gifting that I have been given by God, not me, is just obvious. That's all. We get to see it. That doesn't make me a super Christian, though I've talked about the super sheep syndrome as well. Some of you are aware of that. It makes me an obedient follower of Jesus Christ whose giftings is being used for the benefit of not me, but someone else. Whoa, did you catch that mouthful? Robert Mulholland Jr. once put together a quote, and I loved it so much. He said that uh, ultimately spiritual formation, the journey of our faith is for the benefit of someone else. Follow me on this. You are to be conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. That's when you know you've really turned a corner in your faith, is when you can acknowledge that quote. Your spiritual growth is really not so much for yourself. My gifting is not so much that I can feel affirmed by you and complimented by you. And you know, one uh, pastor once said that it's a shame today that all this preaching is going in the wrong direction because we used to be fishers of men and now we're fishers of compliments. Oh, what did you think of my message? Oh, did you like my message? It's a pretty good message. Did you hear that quote? It's a pretty good quote. Come on, make me feel good because I don't feel good. Blah, blah, blah. What? Really? So it's interesting to me that we have a tendency to look at the super Christian syndrome, but actually what Peter is saying, don't, don't look at me. Don't you do that. Look to God. When you see something that's praiseworthy, praise God. When you see something that's amazing and you know it's a gifting and it's the power and the work of God, praise God. By all means, affirm people in their service unto the Lord, but do not lose sight of its source. So what Peter is saying is, listen, you really want to grab on to a quote-unquote secret of a victorious Christian life? Here it is. Just normal people filled with God's Spirit. Are you a normal person here today? Just a normal, average person? Well, some of you are like, no, I'm just a freak, you know. Okay, well, freaks are included. <laughs> just normal people filled with the Spirit of God. If you're a believer here today, if you're not a believer, this doesn't count for you, sorry. If you, if you haven't committed your life to Jesus Christ, I can't make this pledge to you. But if you're a believer today and you said, yeah, okay, I believe that Jesus who says he is, I'm going to follow him, you have, now have the Spirit of God living in you. That comes with a whole lot of power. But power for what? Power so you can look good? Power so you can be impressive? power so you can display in biblical jeopardy all your wondrous knowledge. No, it's the power to benefit someone else in life. Whoa! That's why it was just a few years ago I came to a, a life-changing thought, and it said the proof of my ministry is going to be you. The proof of ministry is people. That, that's a wild thought, because I often had thought that, no, the proof of my ministry is a thriving ministry. The proof of my ministry is a large church with lots of people and blah, 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 or lots of money or whatever the normal metrics are. You do know there are metrics for church, right? That I am measured week in and week out by, by the denomination as well as the Yuba City campus, as well as our own internal. We are measured by metrics. You understand that? But you know what I think of the metrics? <laughs> no, seriously, because I know now to be, it's not that they're unimportant. 
Okay, if you don't have money to make payroll, that's kind of awkward, right? It's something ain't right. You know, if you don't have anyone coming to hear you preach, well, something might be going wrong. So it's not that metrics are unimportant, but the point that Peter's saying is, why do you stare at the Christians thinking they're super? They're not. God is super. And he works through faithful people. So it's just normal people filled with the Spirit of God. When we grab onto that, we can then get to the thought that James brought out to us in worship. And it goes like this, the same power that empowered the apostles, empowers us. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in everyone who faithfully follows Jesus Christ. It may look different in your life than it looks in my life. For some, that power might generate people to walk away from addictions that have enslaved them. For others, it may be get them to walk away from gossip or hatred or anger. God's power manifests itself in ways that it's needed and that power is personal. That power is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus presents the reality of the Holy Spirit in you in some interesting ways, doesn't he? He says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. This is a promise for anyone who commits their life to Jesus. And what does this power do? Well, the word itself, power, is the word dynamis. Remember we talked about that? Sounds like some kind of Greek cuss word, dunamis. Or dunamis, if you prefer, dunamis, dunamis, whatever. It means, of course, we get an English word from it that means dynamite. So it's saying that literally just normal people, normal people filled with God's spirit, which is God's explosive power to deal with all the problems of this world. Oh, really? God's explosive power in your life to tear down obstacles, break away things that get in your path so that you can benefit someone else. Not so your walk amongst the roses could be completely pleasant without strife or pain or difficulty. Sometimes we do have those seasons of nice walks in the garden, don't we? He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. We have those. And sometimes we walk in the valley of the shadow of death. But even then we fear no evil, right? Why? Because you are with me. So just normal people filled with God's spirit. Let's unpack this just a little bit further. Let's go deeper. The other thing they said in this passage of scripture that is really pretty awesome is Peter, it's almost like Peter is saying, do you really know who this Jesus is? Do you have any clue, people, as he's talking to the crowd, of when I say the name of Jesus, what I'm actually saying before the heavens, the host of heaven, before the world and the universe? Do you understand how significant the name of Jesus is? He even goes on to say you, and he's talking to the people, by the way, who were there in Holy Week when Jesus was stood before the crowd. And a week prior, all the crowds were amazed by his miracles. People are so fickle, right? We human creatures are so fickle. They were amazed by his power. They're like, Hosanna, praise the Lord. We love you. Jesus is awesome. He's riding in a donkey. He's the king. Woo! One week later, kill him, dirty rat. Kill him. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Well, many of these people that were there yelling crucify were in this crowd too. And now all of a sudden they're seeing a miracle and it's by the name of that guy that y'all sent to death. Remember Jesus? So he says, uh, Peter says, the Holy One. You do realize in Old Testament language, that is derived for God and God alone. The Holy One. Goes on to say the Righteous One. And in case you're kind of confused about that language and you want to explain it away, he goes on to say the Author of Life. So, so he says to them, you rejected the Holy One, you disowned the Author of, excuse me, you disowned the Righteous One, and you murdered the author of life. I mean, think of the irony and the, the, the satire in this that that group had murdered the author of life. Why? To set free a murderer. I can see you're not as impressed, so I'll move on. But whoa, I was blown away by that thought. But I was also blown away when I started to research some of these words without you know, digging too deeply into a word study. The word that for author of life can be used in a couple different ways. I was, thought it was pretty impressive. The word is archegos, archegos, archegos. You might think archaic or arc leader. Let's unpack it. The author of life. It's saying that, if, do you know who Jesus is? When we say the author of life, it is often used as a military term. He's saying that literally Jesus is the top leader, the arc leader, the commander, the chief, the captain, the ruler, the champion. When you've seen Jesus, you've seen the champion of life goes on to say that he's the commander, the leader, the ruler of life. And if that's as far as we went, that would be a gee whiz interesting point. But actually, Peter implies so much more. 
when he says that you've murdered the author of life, funny thing is, after you've murdered him, he rose again to life after he was dead. So that tells us when he says author of life, he means more than Jesus was a good CEO. He is literally implying that Jesus is the holy one, the righteous one, the author and originator, the, the very source of life. Listen, this idea that Jesus was just a good man or a good prophet or a good teacher and we can celebrate the wondrous phrases and parables, he said, falls short of the reality of who Jesus really is. He is the source of life itself. And not just that, he's the director of life. He is literally the life worth living. It's saying that he's the founder, the source, the giver. All of this is found in Jesus. Now, do you understand that in life today, we can, we can wrestle with a thousand different problems? Anyone aware that there are a lot of difficulties in this world? A lot of challenges? Yeah, you're aware of that? A lot of strife, a lot of hard times, financial issues, in-laws, children, parenting, you know, whatever you know, long lost brothers that come out of the woodwork, you know, whatever the thing might be, we can suffer a thousand different types of tribulations. And what's interesting is we can lose sight of the life we were meant to live in the process. In other words, our problems often drift us into darker places. Our problems often panic, panic us, and we're not sure how to deal with them. And here comes Peter saying, Do you, wait a minute, wait a minute. You say you're a Christian, a little Christ one. You're a follower of Jesus. Are you aware of who this Jesus really is? And what difference does that make to the life we live with a thousand different problems? Well, it makes an awful lot when you realize that he's the author of life, the source of life, and he is life itself. When you come to Jesus, you come to the life that we were all meant to live. Allow me to paraphrase a couple passages of scripture that you've probably read before. Colossians 1, 15 through 20 says something interesting about Jesus. It says that the universe was made by him, for him, and through him, and that all things in essence are made by Jesus, that he's the source of that. It goes on to say that in essence, Jesus is the image of God, that he has the supremacy in all things. It then goes on to say that in fact, Jesus on the cross is reconciling all things in the heavens and the earth. That's pretty amazing, don't you think? Not even our political candidates are proclaiming they will reconcile all things in the heavens and the earth this political season, right? Although probably when they hear this message on YouTube, they'll start using that one. I, if you elect me president, will reconcile all things in the heavens and the earth. Just vote for me, you know. That wouldn't surprise us in this political season, would it? So it's interesting to me that actually it's saying that all things in the universe, guys, the word is cosmos. We're not talking about just in America or just on this planet. It's saying that Jesus is the answer not just to our world, but to all worlds. Jesus is not just the answer to our temporal little issues. He is the answer to the entire universe. Are you getting a picture of how significant Jesus is? Well, there's another passage I'll paraphrase for you. It's Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, and it goes to 3. And it says something fascinating. It says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. We have most of that recorded in the book, right? But in these last days... He has spoken to us through Jesus. He is the exact representation of God's being, sustaining all things through his powerful word. Do you get what that's saying? That when you hear the voice of Jesus, you hear the instructions of Christ, you've come to the instructions of life itself. In fact, there's an interesting point. Someone once said it this way. The further you drift from Jesus, the further you drift from reality. That starts to explain a few people we know, right? The further you drift from Jesus is the further you drift from reality. Isn't that interesting? Because some people accuse Christians of drifting from reality because they come to Jesus. But that can only be true if Jesus is a liar, that he intentionally, knowingly lied to the people back then and all the miracles were somehow fraudulent. Or if he was a lunatic, he was just flat out nuts. I mean, think of some of the things he said. You can only get to heaven through him. If I said that, you would think that's pretty crazy. Or as C.S. Lewis once said, we're left with the ultimate reality. Jesus is Lord. He's exactly who he said he was. And if that's true, what difference does that make for your life? What difference does it make if Jesus is the source of life and in Christ has found true reality as it truly exists, what difference does it make for us? Could it be when our problems come against us, we begin to drift from reality because we no longer have confidence in reality found in Christ? Is this too philosophical? 
You all with me? Okay, because I can go to circus language. I mean, I, I got other tricks here. So as we unpack this, we begin to realize that Jesus is the source of life. When you've come to Jesus, you've come to ultimate reality. And if you truly believe that, then the answers to this world are found in Christ and his promises. The answers to life are found in the instructions of Jesus. Indeed, there's power in the very name of Jesus. And it's like Peter is saying, do you know who this Jesus really is? Peter was there when Jesus Christ lifted his voice and the winds and waves obeyed him. Have you ever worked really hard to fix your hair before some kind of an event or a meeting? Don't look at me, I'm bald. You know I didn't. (laughs) Have you, I said, you ever worked really hard to fix your hair and get ready for something? You step outside and there's a tornado blowing. I mean, it's not really a tornado, but it might as well be because your hair looks like you're in the 80s again. (laughs) Pat Benatar's playing in the background. Your hair's going a thousand different directions. You know what I'm saying? That, that's crazy. You know, you begin to see this kind of happen things and the hair's going crazy and life is hitting you and you don't know what to do about it, right? If you've had those kinds of experiences, you know how things can come against you in this world. But if you come to Jesus, you begin to realize something powerful. He commands the winds and the waves. So when you were having that bad hair day, did you rebuke the wind and it obeyed you? Anyone? You got the power over wind and waves? You and I got to talk, buddy. So we realize that's pretty unique. Or here's another one. Obviously, Peter was here when this happened as well. When Jesus raised his voice, voice and death itself was overruled. I have done a lot of funerals, and I have never overruled death so far. I've only proclaimed Christ's victory in that moment, but I have never overruled death. Jesus overrules death. Isn't that remarkable? So when we come to Jesus, we need to know this truth. We need to know this reality. So it means literally when you come to Jesus, you have come to the way you're supposed to go. When you come to Jesus, you've come to the truth that you are supposed to believe. When you come to Jesus, you come to the life that you are supposed to live. Everything you need is found in Jesus. Everything you need is found in Jesus. He is the author of even your life. You think that you are your parents' fine idea or lack thereof. The truth is, God had a little say in your coming into this world, and God will have a little say when it's time for you to leave this world. And I think you might want to come to know him before that moment happens, right? And so as we unpack this together, we realize as you come to Jesus, you have everything you need, and then I don't know if you caught that part about faith in the name of Jesus. He's like, he's saying, do you really know who Jesus is, and do you have faith in him? Now, if you've been raised in the church, sadly, many churches teach this faith thing in a very bizarre way. They teach you that faith is believing in things that are invisible, and they stop there. They teach you that faith is based on just having enough faith. If you just believe, 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 there's no place like home, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. If I just believe strong enough, it will make it true. That's how a lot of churches teach faith. But if actually you study the Bible, that's not what it says, is it? It says the evidence of things unseen. In other words, there is evidence for you to hang your hat on the reality of who Jesus Christ is. He walked on this earth. He was seen before crowds of thousands. He healed many people. He rose people from the dead before many crowds of people. Even his enemies could not deny his miracles. In fact, they just blamed it on the devil. Well, the devil made him do it. I can't explain how he's so powerful. When he was dead, many people saw him die. And over 40 days, many people saw him alive after he had been dead. At one point, over 500 people witnessed Christ alive again after he was dead. Another point, he was seen in this city. He was seen on the road to Emmaus. He was seen in Galilee. He was seen all over the place. So it was clear that Jesus is who he says he is. Your faith is not based on fantasy, fiction, myth, legend, or your capacity to just believe what you can't see. That is not the biblical definition of faith. It is evidence of things unseen, evidence of things hoped for. We need to stop with this idea that faith is just fiction or I hope it's true because I'm going to die someday and that scares me. That's what your atheist friends believe of you. They believe you've come to a crutch, something to help you because you're a weak person. You're just not strong enough. I learned as a hospice chaplain that's an absurd accusation because we face death, lots of it. And I saw the difference between those who actually knew Christ facing the end of themselves versus those who did not know Christ facing the end of themselves. Can I tell you those are two radically different meetings for me as a hospice chaplain? One I dreaded, 
the other one I look forward to. Because you know, someone is preparing to meet the Lord at the end of their life, they're excited and they want to know, what does the Bible say about the new heavens and the new earth? Well, tell me again, Pastor, what are the dimensions of the new Jerusalem? Tell me what your, your little weird idea is. Didn't you say something about there might be a heavenly news network there in the new city, the new Jerusalem? Why do you believe that? And tell me, why do you believe biblically that maybe our loved ones have a general idea of what's still going on there? Why do you believe that again? And they want to know, and you take them to the Bible, and they're eager. The atheists or the unbeliever or the agnostics are just clinging to this life. They don't know how to process. They're scared to death, and they're being robbed of everything they've ever owned ever loved, and it's just being ripped from them. And even in that moment when everything they've ever trusted in, everything they've ever hoped in, everything they've ever placed their confidence, careers, houses, money in the bank, all of it's failing them. Even in that moment, they resist the living God. They refuse to turn to him. It's remarkable. So now, friends, your faith is not based on fiction, fantasy, or just hoping it's true. That means this word faith is much more than belief. Can I tell you a little funny joke? Because I think it's funny. You may not think it's funny, but I'm going to amuse myself for a few moments. So check it out. She says, okay, great, go ahead. Check it out. So someone once said the devil and the demons are orthodox. Do you agree with that? Do you know what that means? Orthos doxis, two words. My foundation essentials people, TNT, orthos doxis. What does it mean? What? So you're kind of mixing a couple of them, but it, it, means, it means orthos, which means correct or right. And, 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 and doxis means doctrine. It means the devil is a theologian and he knows the word of God. It means the demons even called out Jesus' real names. Even though everyone else didn't know he was the Messiah, they called him the son of God. They called him the living one, the Messiah. Are, are you going to send me away? It's not time yet. They even know what's going to happen to them, right? So their, their doctrine is correct. They believe in God. The devil believes in God. Did you know that? The demons believe in Jesus. They know who he is. We may wishy-wash about who Jesus really is, but the demons, they exactly know. So what that means is faith cannot just be belief because even the demons and the devil believe. It has to be more than that. Faith has to be an action word. Literally, it has to be trusting in the one we know Jesus to be. It means confidence. Literally, if we start unpacking it, it means faith would be active reliance. Faith, faith would be devoted trust. Faith in Jesus would be complete confidence, right? Because there's something that Jesus bought for you on the cross and he bought for me on the cross. And it's really important that we understand that. And if you do, your faith becomes powerful, right? Because you have faith now to face this world's problems. And the thing that he bought on the cross, it's really, I'm gonna simplify it, okay? The first one, he was delivered to death for your sins, for my sins. It meant that he didn't do anything wrong, but he took the punishment for you and for me. It meant whatever you've done in your life, right? Whatever's happened in your little world, however many times you took the Lord's name in vain, which each one is a capital offense, how many times you lied or gossiped or even stole something small or whatever the case might be, how many times you had adulterous affairs in your mind or real adulterous affairs, whatever you've done in your life, right? Jesus died for that. Now, here's what's amazing. It doesn't stop there. That's pretty cool. He got me off the hook. But it's more than that. After Jesus was delivered to death for our sins, he was raised to life for our justification. Huh. Everybody, anyone uh, ever say to you, you need to justify why you even exist. Maybe it was a parent or someone in authority over us, you know. Maybe it was your boss. Justify why I keep you employed here. That's a good question. You should be working hard at work if you're a Christian and not be slacking off. But justify it means literally that Christ justifies you. Your life is met by Christ. It means you always have meaning, value, and purpose because Jesus has declared it so. It means that before God, you are blameless if you have this faith, trust, confidence, and belief. It's a very powerful thing. It means you can leave this day knowing that God loves you, has forgiven you, and will lead you in a different direction in life if you've been going the wrong way. Now, many of us know that. You're like, gee whiz, thanks, pastor. You just told me I'm a Christian. Duh, I knew that before I came in here. Well, let's unpack it some more. So as we come to this reality, we come to the fact that we live by faith in Jesus. What does that do for us? What does confidence and trust do for us? Well, I discovered something some years back, and it's made all the difference for me, and I want to share it with you this way. You need to settle, if you haven't already done so, once and for all, the issue of no matter what comes your way, you will have faith in Jesus. 
You understand what I mean? Invariably what happens in many believers' lives, they haven't really settled this issue. How do we know this? The phone call from the doctor comes and says you're going to die and all of a sudden a crisis hits us. Listen, that should be terribly unfortunate, ugly, bad news. But it should not cause a crisis of faith, should it? It means when bad things come our way and our bank account is bled down to zero and we're not sure how we're going to pay our next bill, should that be a crisis of faith? But didn't Jesus promise to care for every need you have? Not every want, guys, gals, but every need. So wait a minute, if that's true, then why should that cause us so much anxiety to the point of sickness? Let me give you another one. If everyone in your life abandons you, maybe you tweet something that's completely inappropriate, or maybe you refuse to stand for the national anthem or something, and everybody decides to disown you and call you terrible names and they don't want to be around you anymore, but you're a follower of Jesus, if everybody disowns you and abandons you, do you know who will not? Jesus. Do you see where I'm driving? There was a once great leader who stood up in the Old Testament times and he says, choose this day whom you shall serve. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. What it means is settle once and for all in your mind. Guys, you can do this today if you haven't done so, and I can assure you it will change every problem you're facing, whether now or in the future. And this is it. Jesus is Jesus no matter what bad thing comes your way. Jesus is still Lord even when your life seems out of control. Jesus has never left you. Jesus has never abandoned you, nor will he. Human beings will disappoint us. People do terrible, dumb things, and they say mean things. Human beings consistently disappoint us, right? At all levels of society, at all levels of authority, from pastors to presidents, people get disappointed by people. You know who will never really disappoint you? Jesus Christ. So I just wonder, what difference could that make in your life? If today you settled once and for all, I will place my confidence and my trust in Jesus. You see, that's what he's saying here. He's saying that faith made that man strong. It was the faith, presumably, of Peter and John, who knew that Jesus can heal even a man who had been crippled from birth. Is there anything that Jesus cannot do? Is there any promise that we cannot trust that came from Jesus? I mean, it sounds stupid saying it, doesn't it? But can I ask you why we worry about the thousand things that come our way? Why do we stress out? Can I suggest to you one interesting point? All of the worries of this world, they are real. I'm not telling you they're not real. All of the worries of this world knock us on our tails because we have unbelief lingering in our hearts. Now, I don't mean unbelief as in Jesus is not Jesus, but it's an unbelief of realizing what Jesus really is. Faith, confidence, trust, and assurance. Is Jesus really who he says he is in your heart and your mind? If he is, you've got an awful lot of promises to sustain you, don't you? If he's reconciling all things in the heavens and the earth, will he not reconcile you as well? If he's setting the captives free, can he not set you free as well? If he's promised to meet all your needs and says that God loves you so much that every hair on your head is numbered or there are the lack thereof, can you not trust him? right? If he says that, you know, look at the birds of the air, they don't stress out and have anxiety and popping anti-anxiety pills and going and sitting and laying. Could you imagine a sparrow laying on a little bench somewhere? And he said, tell me about your mother. And the sparrow goes, tweet, 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 abandon me when I was only six and so forth. Could you imagine that? No, because we don't see that. That's why Jesus says, look at the birds. They're just out there flying. They're out there making cool noises to us as beautiful music. To them, it's some serious fights. That's my water hole. That's my food. This is my spot. You know, they're fighting, but to us, it sounds so lovely. Can I tell you, I think God did that for us so we don't have to hear their bickering. If we could really understand what they were saying, it was like, get out of this neighborhood, this is my neighborhood. And you're like, no, this is my house. I put out this hummingbird feeder. Why are you guys fighting? Stop fighting, you idiots. There's enough for everybody. I think I'm getting off track. (laughs) The point is, is if Jesus is trustworthy, are you fully trusting him? Think of the problems you might be facing. Let me ask you this one, and maybe this is true of people in the room. If you're dying right now, what happens next? If you believe in Jesus Christ, what happens next? You enter into the presence of a God who's prepared a place for you and has been eagerly awaiting your return. You get to see the one that you've been talking to and thinking about and studying about. You get to see him face to face. There's been songs sung about this moment. And the one who can carry you through this world will bring you to the next 
And it's an amazing promise that Jesus has promised for your future. He's promised for your present. So, you know, it'd be like this. It's an interesting story. Someone once said it this way. Everybody talks about heaven like it's so lovely, but nobody wants to go there. I mean, gosh, 123 years old, and they're begging the pastors to come around and please pray for me in healing so I don't have to go to heaven. Please, right? doesn't matter if you're 12 or 120. We all have that strange, dare I say, lack of faith. And how much faith did Jesus say you really had to have to be a super Christian? How much faith? You know this stuff. Do you know what that means? That means as a group of people, though, we all have troubles together and we can gather and some of us are celebrating and some of us have hard times and some of us have real challenges. None of us are defeated by these challenges, right? None of us are filled with anxiety that's just crippling us, right? None of us came in here with worry that's tying our stomachs in a knot, right? None of us is worried about our finances so much that we question our future, right? Can I tell you if I hooked you up to a machine right now, I would get a whole bunch of worries, anxieties, and stresses. Can I ask you theologically, why? Is Jesus who, is Jesus who he says he is? If he is, that doesn't mean the problems aren't real, but it means they are opportunities to see God work, right? I mean, I am not divorced from the same troubles and worries that you face, right? Don't think because I have a title pastor in my name that finances don't become inconvenient, right? Don't think because I have my name pastor that illness and medical problems and everything that comes with us or depressions or challenges or or interpersonal conflicts or don't think that somehow I'm immune to those. Anyone here think I'm immune to that? The difference is I am constantly reminded because it's my job to go to the word of God and remember that God is trustworthy. Amen? Amen. So hopefully you've been able to come to this particular passage. There's a verse I want to share with you in conclusion that, uh, I don't know, we may have it on the screen. It's Isaiah. You probably know this one. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Here's a good memory verse for somebody, y'all. It says this. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. That first phrase, Those who hope in the Lord. Do you have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have hope for today? Do you have hope for your finances through Jesus Christ that you won't actually starve and die and be a poor, penniless beggar on the side of the road that will not get fed? No, you won't feel that way because Jesus promised you won't be there no matter what trouble comes your way. Remember what Paul said? We'll get there. What was the secret of contentment? What was the secret of troubles and turmoil and problems? What was the secret? Some of y'all know that the secret of contentment Oh my gosh, I'm a terrible pastor. I'm not being rhetorical. What's the secret biblically, the secret of contentment? Oh, well, obviously that's the answer. Wow, that's right. Yeah, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Why isn't that top of mind? It means you can face an IRS audit through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. You can face a layoff at your job through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. You can face the dark valley of the shadow of death as a loved one you care for is dying and you're walking that journey with them. You can face that through Christ Jesus. You can face your own mortality through Christ Jesus because exactly how mortal are you if Christ is going to raise you from the dead and you get to spend eternity with him? Do we really believe what we say we believe? Because if we do, your problems begin to look really dinky. But unfortunately, we allow our problems to be so big that even the shadow of the problem overwhelms us. Time Life, I think it was Time Life, did an article series not too long ago, and it took a list of, I think it was a 1,000 candidates, and it asked them, uh, it was a 10-year study, what are the things you worry about today? I worry about getting sick. I worry about my children's health. I worry about, you know, finances. I worry about my retirement. I worry about... And then it asked them 10 years later, of those items, what came to pass? It was like 98.6% of that long list of 1,000 people that worried about, 98.6% did not happen. So wait a minute. How much energy and strife and anxiety was spent on those worries over a 10-year period Worries that would never actually happen. I don't know. That's a pretty powerful bit of evidence, wouldn't you think? And remember, your faith is evidence. You don't believe in Jesus because it's a sweet idea. You believe in Jesus because you've come to know it's true. And if it's true, every promise he gives you is true. 
So this word, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, what it says is your hope in God, your hope in his character, your hope in his promises, that's what strengthens you, right? Not how much money you have in the bank account or how healthy you are. It's your hope in Jesus. It's your hope in God. Another translation words it differently. It says, those who wait upon the Lord will be strengthened. What are you waiting for? You're waiting for him to fulfill his promises. Everything he promised you is going to happen through Christ Jesus. It's yes. There's another translation that says the NLT, those who trust in God renew their strength. Can I tell you that's true in all translation? Those who wait in the Lord, those who trust in the Lord, and those who hope in the Lord, their strength will be renewed. Can I ask you, did anyone come in here with no strength? Did anyone come in here overwhelmed by their problems and troubles and tribulations and in-laws and spouses and kids and dogs and whatever? Anyone come in here with a little trouble? Can I say you've just been given the ultimate answer to life and reality? Trust Jesus. He has failed no one and never will. Stand up, will you? Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to open up your words and be reminded that you are trustworthy and true. It sounds silly even to say that out loud, to just keep reminding us we need to trust you and have faith in you and confidence in you, that you are working all things out. Lord, we know that you told us not to be aware of our problems. You told us not to be overwhelmed by our problems. So help us in Jesus' name. Amen.